We fear that they had something out that the majority of the people don't know about. Hey, well, I'm some halfblood and halfblood are giving halfblood. Now I show you what. Now I'm up feelings that that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. Get a lot of killers. Why you think our country's so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Hello and welcome to Barn Blog. I'm here with Elijah Emery, and we are setting out to clarify Christopher Lash and particularly some of the harder elements of his middle period work. What exactly is this class theory? What are the parties of the consciousness, a.k.a. the party of the id, the party of the ego, and the party of the superego? And what the hell does that mean? And lastly, was Lash correct in asserting that the values of the lower classes and the lumpenized would become more generalized throughout society? And why? All right. So, hi, Elijah. Hey, everyone. Hi, Varn. Um, so, um, in, in New Radicalism in America, Lash talks about the intellectuals as a class, kind of children of the bourgeoisie and the petite bourgeoisie, but who are not actually involved in industry. Um, and at the time that he's writing about them, often are not academic shit either. Um they to, like founding think tanks and such uh, right like proto ngos basically is what yeah that's a perfect way of describing it um you know like jane adams for example the settlement movement uh mm -hmm. parallel institutions um which serve many of the same functions contemporary ngos do so We have this sort of development. Now, a lot of people read Lash and they go, well, he's talking about the PMC. But I find it interesting because, one, as I pointed out to people, John and Barbara Ehrenreich came up with that term not before, say, World of Nations or Agony of the American Left, but before, say, Culture of Narcissism. Um, I believe the professional managerial class book came out in the late 70s yeah um i think i don't remember but culture of narcissism is is 70 uh 79 right? right um so unless it's the very 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 late 70s it's before culture of narcissism yeah it's 77 just 77 john and barbara aaron reich put published that book in 77 um so, and it's interesting because basically only Adolf Reed uses it for like, I don't know, uh, let's say 20 years. Um, and then it's resurrected partially by Catherine Liu, partially by some other people, uh, Amber A. Lee, um, Angela Nagel, who we talked a little bit about, um, et cetera, kind of restore that. Now, what I've, I've, I've pointed out, uh, in my review of Lou's book, which people think I'm purely negative on, I actually gave it a, a three out of five stars, which is not, a you know, it wasn't, I, I don't think it's a bad book, um, but I don't think it's a book about political economy at all. Um, it's pure cultural criticism, even more than, say, cultural narcissism, which does have a lot more political economy in it. Um, but... I found it interesting that there was this turn after the Bernie failure to resurrect the category that was really about, you know, what Lash was talking about in the multiversity and progressive education, um, this this development out of this intellectual class of like the formerly bourgeois, um, 
into a more institutionalized norm after the New Deal during the Fordist period. But what's interesting is he never calls it a unified class like that. He talks about different classes, frankly. Um, the intellectuals, the bureaucrats, he sees as a separate entity, even though he sees the intellectual classes serving the bureaucratic class. He doesn't say they're the same. So that's a difference from the PMC theory. Um, he also, and I, yeah, I think this is something that I find suspect in Lash, but I think he's right, talks about correctly that American origins and the design of American government assume that uh, there is no wage earning class. There's basically the bourgeois, the petite bourgeois, and the artisans. And like when Marx was using the term artisan in 1848 to deal with, you know, working class broadly. Uh, he did, Marx did not think artisans were proletarians, uh, but that they they were so already so petite bourgeoisie that they may as well have their interests in line with the proletarians. You have a similar movement in Lash, um, where Lash almost idolizes, and I think if you misread Lash, it's easy to think he's telling us to go back to the home economy, even though he over and over and over again says that's not possible. Yeah, I mean uh, he's. He's he's suggesting that we have to find parallel things to what the home economy offered. Um, so, for example, uh, a sense of responsibility, uh, a sense of competence, the arena, the uh, ability to to rule oneself and uh, cooperate in, in a, a comprehensible uh, sphere. Um, but, you know, he also says how poor so many of our replacements are. So an example is home ownership, which he mentions is like, this is not a replacement for the farm. Um, it doesn't do any of the same things in, in a, like a, I think it's, it's in true and only heaven. Uh, it's like a sub, a sub thing. So it's just like a little paragraph in the middle of nowhere. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, he's not, He's not arguing to go back. He's arguing to understand and carry out some similar things that were psychologically available to people at a prior era of development. Mm -hmm. You may completely disagree. I, you know, um, no, I'm torn on that. It's, it's because uh, Julian Assail and I had a conversation about this and Julian accuses Lash of, uh, idolizing the artisan and again, not putting in this proper political economic context, therefore uh, being nostalgic. I don't entirely think that's true, but I do think there is an issue that he wants to replicate yeah. some of those things. And I don't know where I'm just like, I don't know that that's possible. Yeah. I mean, I look, I, you know, I think that, uh, I think that the more important thing uh, is, asserting a common life and mm -hmm. asserting the ability to govern oneself. Right. Um, you know, and this is, this is an underlying element of, of, of socialism is the notion of ruling one's economic circumstances. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Lash is saying that artisans had an ability to rule over themselves in a way that's different from wage workers, uh, which I don't think is something anybody could disagree with. Um, though, of course, you know, this is not to say that artisans should be lionized or that artisans had no challenges. It's just to say they're different. And a lot of things that were available to artisans are not available to wage workers. Right. But one of the things Lash is actually pressing it on before we started talking about pro list have pro uh, precarization or relumpenization um, was that he even thought that wage worker uh, virtues and morality were were being were declining? Yeah. Um, in some ways, he sounds like maybe somebody like J.D. Vance before J.D. Vance became a Trumpist and whatever, uh, but not entirely because he also sees that going not just to the working class but well up into the quote middle classes and mm -hmm. and this is where where Blash's class schema because it's opaque a little bit. Um, 
becomes amenable to something like the PMC because, well, we got the bureaucratic class. We know kind of what they are. We know what this intellectual class kind of is, particularly once it's institutionalized and you have the academia. Um, but what we don't really know is who is the working class now that we are dealing with deindustrialization. Yeah. Um, a lot of times Lash seems to mean the working poor, um, but not always. And I think this is also an issue when you when you have and talk about other classes in general, like the intellectual class that he's talking about. It's a little hard to figure out exactly what they are. Also, uh, he talks about like the class of housewives of like failed petite bourgeois businessmen in the nineteen in the eighteen nineties, um, and that's also an interesting development to kind of parse out. Um, Lash seems to think all this is you know, bad. Like he's not, he's not, one of the things I think what surprised people and where he almost, where Julia Sell says he sounds almost like a neoconservative is when he talks about um, over-reliance on the state and social welfareism that's targeted um, to save the family because even that would further erode family bounds and further subject it to instrumentalized uh, interventions by outside experts. Um, it's a big thing in that Takun essay that we talked about. It's also a huge part of critique of progress. Um, and that does sound like people talking about the PMC and like the ever expand, the expansion of HR codes into your personal life and, and this, that, and the other. Uh, are what someone like Paul Godfrey would call managerial liberalism. Yeah. Um, what do we think is actually going on, and how is what Lash is saying different from, like, say, the PMC thesis is understand by Aaron Reich or Catherine Liu? So I think one thing that's different is the purpose to which this critique is deployed. Uh, I think Lash is correct in asserting that out of conflict and out of interaction with the state, with uh, capitalism in a number of forms, people can gain confidence to continue on, uh, you know, to continue c combating these things and gain power and agency for the working class and for themselves. Um, so Lash's critique of the welfare state is sort of instrumental in this because he assumes the welfare state is being delivered by, not by the working class, but by the managerial class, basically. Um, and obviously now I'm running into like all of these problems with misdefining the things which we're setting out to define right now. Um, but what he seems to be arguing to me is ways in which uh, ways in which combating visible elements of the current accord can result in people transcending those elements and entering into radical politics again. Mm -hmm. um, and you see in the early lash, which is some is, is a lot easier to understand in some ways, an equivalent thing in his essay on McGovernism, where he says that McGovernism is radical in the sense that once enacted, the demands it will unleash are so radical that they can't be solved through the present system. Um, and I think in the way in which he suggests opposing the welfare state, on the grounds of it eliminating agency over people's own lives, what he's speaking to is a broader uh, attempt to encourage people to form alternative institutions to those offered by the state and to form organizations that enable them to have demands that once enacted will result in even more radical demands occurring. Um, is he correct about what those institutions are? You know, I, I don't think an opposition to the welfare state is really the most productive uh, 
the most productive thing, um, especially because it's apparent now that the welfare state is very hard to maintain and it requires a lot of mass politics and a lot of participation on behalf of working people in order to maintain or enact further reforms uh, enlarging the welfare state. Um, and so I think one error Lash has is in asserting that the form that welfareism takes is such that uh, that welfare, you know, welfareism itself cannot be an avenue towards an enactment of a more radical politics, which I'm not saying it's the best avenue, but I'm saying it's an avenue. I mean, it's interesting because I think about that in the classical the Trotskyist defense of moving away from the minimum maximum program to the transitional program is that is exactly what you're describing, actually. Yes, the minimum program can build a build a bridge to a more radical future that's in the minimum program is reformist almost inherently. But what Trotsky says is well, you since the second international, you get stuck defending that minimum program, you can't move past it. Um so you come up with the transitional program that tries to do one one while pushing another to a more maximalist program very quickly. But then the problem with that ends up being that the transitional program usually ends up being a minimal program anyway. Yeah. So it's, you know, I, I state this because this is not unique to Lash. This is a problem all over the reform and revolution debates um, in general. I, and, and, sorry. Go um, ahead. Another element is, even though Lash is aware that the narcissistic society or that the culture of narcissism is fading away, in the moment, I think he's aware of the fact that tendencies within it have curtailed the ability of the left. And he sees uh, particular aspects of petit bourgeois culture, working class culture, middle class culture um, as arenas with which to combat the culture of narcissism and isolate people in positions of radical politics from some of its more damaging aspects. Um, and in that way, this type of morality and, and this, you know, working class ethic is sort of an avenue towards transcending, transcending, you know, a feeling of dependence and giving people the ability to, empower themselves right well um, i mean i think this is this is a this is where i almost sound like a conservative yeah and this is something that i got from lash but i've been on for many years i hate using the language of victimhood when yeah we talk about leftist politics um particularly when we when we mix it up with emotive conceptions for example there are many many ways in which uh uh women are horribly dealt with and mistreated in uh, in, in our society um we still live in a, in a society that's very much in in a sex war with all kinds of all kinds of problems um and i don't want to d d pretend that that's not real but there is a sense in which like women being afraid of strangers killing them like strange men just coming up and killing them is the same as the American public being afraid of Islamic terrorists. It's not that it never happens, but it statistically is super damn rare. Um, you know, uh, the average person is going to kill you as a woman is your partner. Like, and so we have people afraid of the wrong things, but we, since we push this emotive language, like, like, you know, that it completely misses the point. And I also think it misses the point on some other issues. Like, like for example, um, a lot of people think that when I, I asked the other day, I mentioned this earlier, like I asked who is the most person murdered and everyone, uh, like indigenous women, like indigenous women are murdered. Uh, they're the, they're the most murdered group of women. Uh, absolutely true. Proportionally, not in absolute numbers. Cause there's unfortunately not a lot of indigenous women left in, North America, but um, but uh, indigenous men are murdered at an alarming rate. Um, black men are murdered at an alarming rate, and poor white men are murdered at an alarming rate. I mean, like it's it's it's, and I'm not saying that as an either or, 
I'm saying that it's actually a lot of the horrible shit that happens to women isn't murder. Like, it's uh, m- medical institutions not taking them seriously, which is a real fucking problem. It's um, child care. It's the expectation. There's a thousand ways in which this the anxiety being expressed in this fear of murder comes from real shit, but it's being manifested as something that kind of isn't that much of a threat. And yeah. I actually see, like Lash, this is this a way to redirect people's attention in ways that controls them. And I actually see progressives and the left in their constant talk of victimization, even even when we talked about the post-leftists in our last episode, but even the post-leftists talk about the victimization of the working class. They are doing it too. Mm-hmm. Like... Um, you are disempowering people, opening up for open them up for manipulation, and also hiding from them the actual systemic threats in their lives. Um, and this is this is one reason why Lash has a more favorable view towards black nationalism than other like cultural forms, you know, uh, or of of politics. I mean, uh, it's because you know the black power movement, right? This is the opposite of victimization. It's it's self empowerment. Um, yeah, and, and, although he's more sanguine on black nationalism than black power, like actually that. Yeah, no, I, I'm, you're you're like completely. But I'm I'm just using this as a very very simple like mm-hmm. contrast, um, and it's because he prioritizes movements that claim a space of agency and do what they can, um, because. One thing he's very clear on and is very true is that it's very it, it's not possible to shame people into giving you what you want in, you know, in like and, and have it be yours. Right. Uh, you know, in a, in a very general way, whatever you want, be it a political goal or uh, ownership of something um, or any number of things. You have to earn it in some way. And it doesn't have to just be, you know, economic. It can be moral. It, it, it connects to just if you're able to utilize it, not if you're able to possess it. And this is how he, he thinks about class power, I think, in his later books, is that he's arguing, well, you know, uh, in, in the contemporary way in which class power has been offered, which is through a kind of defanged labor movement, um, it's not class power that can actually be utilized very effectively. It's class mm-hmm. power with very limited horizons and which has to jettison a lot of underlying critiques in order to operate even in the limited way it can. And the course of his life is a description of the destruction of that form of class power um, because it wasn't strong uh, when it when it came down to it, it or it wasn't strong enough to effectively oppose uh, the concerted forces of capital and of the state. Um, And this is something which he distinguishes from more efficacious forms of politics that rely upon people making things for themselves so that they can use them as they please. I would say then this, this is a very different than the, PMC stealing the working classes valor thesis of yeah. of of a lot of contempor- of a lot of contemporary politics. One, Wash doesn't see the the other classes as that unified in one homogenous form. This is also one of the things I say. Like professionals and man and managers and college graduates and they're it's not a all very, the very fractured ruling class. Yeah. It, it, it also it's forty percent of the population. Like even Peter Turchin and those kind or, or Michael Lind, who I we I talked about a little bit earlier, um, they don't even have that that broad of a of a ruling class that also somehow rules from the center of society. It's a very when you really think about it, it's a very strange. But what it does speak to is something else that Lash was coming on to the 80s was the segregation of the classes from each other yeah um even though class values were moving up so one of the things that i find interesting about lash and 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 i'll get to like i have critiques of lash one thing that i will say about lash is lash doesn't seem to think that class abolition is really possible no um and and of course as a marxist i have to balk at that 
Like that's our goal. Our goal is not just working class power. Our goal is working class power so that there are no other classes. Um, now you might go, well, that's a utopian goal. And I might say, well, maybe, but it's the one objective condition that we can imagine that we could do that with. Um, the other conditions will still be antagonistic. Um, and so, for example, like people who pretend that like just getting rid of capitalism, which is going to automatically get rid of racism. I just think that's fundamentally not true. Like, um, I think it would, I think racism would be inherently different in a non-capitalist society, for example, but it wouldn't necessarily that, that genie's already been let out of the box with the development of modernity. So these are going to be issues that we have to deal with and they have to be dealt with in a variety of ways and they will be different under non-capitalist conditions, but that doesn't mean they won't be around. And, yeah. and so there's a whole lot of like, you know, left talk where like, if we just solve, ca and, and this is from the, often from the left that we would see more assuaged to our side where like, if we just saw us solve capitalism, you know, structural racism go away. Well, structural racism would get, structural racism maybe would go away, but other kinds of uh, ethnic and racial antagonisms would not necessarily, um, which is why the national question is like this petard that, that all the left gets hung up on because they don't have a good answer to it. Lash doesn't try to answer it. No, I, like at all. He doesn't like um, and like I said, that's kind of a fair critique of him. It's like like he sees America as a cultural unit that's fairly cohesive. It has its own history, um, but he kind of takes it as a given. Um, and I don't think a good leftist can do that, but it does remove him from this PMC critique. And also it does it, it is it points out the limits in a way that actually that Lash is more consistent with classical Marxism uh, than, say, post-Bonapartist Marxism or social democracy, where Marxism admits that the state is class and that state power uh, might be necessary for a lot of things, but it's not. Like, if there's a state, even in Lenin, you still have a class existing. Like, that's what that means. And um, a lot of what Marx is arguing for is not just the welfare of workers. And he does argue for the welfare of workers. Like he talks about the need to create enough social surplus that we can take care of people who don't work, not just be fair. That's, that's part of the, the, you know, from each to their own ability to each of their own need invocation, which is not something that Marx even came up with. Right. Um, this is but, like a whole concept. Yeah. But what, what Lash picks up from this is self-agency, both collectively and individually, is tied together. Like, one of the things about, the nar about narcissism and the minimal self is that the irony of this hyper-individualist framework is that it actually leads to... To new, new and more entrenched forms of dependence. Right. It, 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 it is a hyper-dependent, yeah. um, hyper-anxious hyper hyper conformist even um form of selfhood that doesn't really see itself in the future or the past but is obsessed with both in strange ways right um now we seem to have shifted talk it from class but this is important for lash's understanding of the problems with the development of the bureaucratic class the intellectual class's role in that the role of management the role of the managers but why he does not see them as the same class because they have different agency. Yeah. Um, um, they have different agency and they also uh, have different ideas about what agency entails and what it right. means and where it comes from. Yeah. Cause I, cause I, I do think we have to be honest and then be like, well, it is fundamentally not true that like the HR manager and the, and the academic consultant um, and the NGO manager and how they have aligned values. They, they borrow concepts ad hoc from each other, rip them out, decontextualize them and weaponize them. That's absolutely true, but their fundamental apparatuses and values are different. Yeah. And they're also tied into different parts of the economy, which is why like the HR departments are only woke 
in areas of the country that are really woke or in sections of the economy that are really woke. I will tell you, for example, as a teacher, even in a progressive state, we've never been asked to list our pronouns. <laughs> like, like, not that I would care. Though I will say that my mom, who is a teacher, is a teacher at a, she's a high school teacher and she's a high school teacher at a private school in New York. And, and they probably do. And they have you list your pronouns. They, right. assi- they have assigned reading where you have to read, you know, like a, a, a particular book and like some of the options are like, I don't know, like de racismizing teaching or something, you know, like uh, racismizing, te- like this is like a fake book title. I'm just I'm, I'm illustrating your point by by saying this is tethered to where you are, what what the structure around it is. It's not internal to the logic of either this profession or of what it does. Right. Um, and it's class. One of the things I would I would say, for example, if you talk even in Salt Lake, if you talk to a teacher who teaches mostly upper class kids, they're going to say that all cl- all the kids today are queer. I don't know really what that means um, because they don't date. Uh, but but whatever. If you talk to someone like me who teaches, and I do teach a lot of upper classes, but I also teach far out excerpt Nouveau Riche kids who are reactionary. Their parents, not they aren't. Their parents are, and they're just reflecting their parents' values. Um, or uh, poor Latin kids uh, who I also work with. No, they're not. They're much less likely to bully over sexuality issues than in the past. That's absolutely true. Uh, But they're not all queer. All right. And I point this out to people because I'm like, you are, we live in a society that Lash was seeing getting more and more economically segregated. And I think to now it's to the point it's sectionally segregated that people literally cannot imagine what's going on in other sections of the economy, even in the same region and area in which they live. Yeah. And there's only a few professions met and unfortunately they are quote the borderline pmc professions these are these like when they when you hear people talk about it michael lynn writes a lot about this uh they're like teachers but not professors uh nurses but not doctors like people who have who are educated and have professional roles are some of the experts lash is complaining about but are also kind of semi-proletarianized and have to move between different classes of people in a way that very few people left in our society, including and especially college professors, no longer have to do. I mean, like you'll see this in like hospice care workers is such a good example. Mm -hmm. Um, Because based on, you know, the fact that Medicare is universally available to old people uh, and also that, you know, it's especially within regions, there's only a handful of hospice companies uh, the same people who will be ca- taking care of one, like, you know, super rich guy for a while are then going to be taking care of somebody poor, like uh, teach and teachers, public school teachers are the same way. Uh, and especially because, you know, every town has a wrong side of the tracks in some right. way or another. Right. And um, if you're like me, you work with the district level even more than at the school level, because at the school level, you can still be pretty pretty isolated into what economic groups are teaching although you'll go home to a different community probably yeah um where you're if you're someone like me who deals with a broad district that's spread out over um, a, a fairly big geographical area that has urban rural exurban and and suburban in the same district which i do um you see radically different stuff between different groups and you can you can kind of guess values like for me it's not just like i can't just tell who's like rich and who's poor i can tell you who's nouveau rich and what their likely politics are going to be versus someone who's who's and let me tell you the nouveau rich are reactionaries they tend to be trumpist and the rich tend to be woke liberals like like and and like that's a vulgar generalization but it's one that i could statistically bear out Right. Uh, one of the things Lash, however, points to that despite this segregation, the hopelessness and, and the kind of values that one used to associate with the underclass, which is not even the working class, like what people would call lump in or the precariat or whatever. Um, he talks about it in the terms of the ghettos. These have right. been generalized to all of society, right. including the rich. And I think that's absolutely true. 
Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think part of it is the logic of where the threats in survivalism are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he illustrates, let's say, three threats in the minimal self. The Holocaust or some equivalent event, the climate crisis or some equivalent event, and nuclear war or some equivalent event. These are generalizable conditions. These are things still like, with us, by the way. Like, and they're, they're all worse now. Yeah. Um, you know, but th these are like universal conditions. These are not limited to a particular social class. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one reason why uh, people, you know, I, I think one thing the, the, he mentions is that the rich, you know, attack, affix themselves to interpretations of survivalism that originate in lower sectors of society. Uh, and I'm kind of intuiting this in part because they have like such a trust in experts that they're trusting in the experts of survivalism, which is the poor. Um, and uh, right, this is why they always see the novelty in the very poor. This is a very this is a sociological phenomenon that I've seen in my real life and even frankly with partners. <laughs> Yeah, um, where like my partner's up, you know, comes from an upper middle class background. She, she and I are the same class, even though we have a different habitat. We come from different class backgrounds, right? Uh, um, but she has this obsession, or she did. It actually has kind of gone away as she's gotten poor as well. She hasn't gotten poor; she's everything else has gotten more expensive, um, and her life has stayed the same. Um, where where she was very like she would go out and do a homeless stuff and like kind of almost see like this nobility in them and i would go out and do homeless stuff and be like but like this is a just degrade yourself it has damage you are likely to get addicted to drugs and drugs when you're in this situation and you're socially isolated have a far more effect like like if you and I experiment with drugs, we're not as likely to not have supports for the downside and we're not as likely to get addicted. And this is a fact yeah. like like addiction um, is not just the chemical dependency. It's a chemical dependency plus the social context. Yeah. Um, yeah. My, and, my my girlfriend's family is from West Virginia. So, you know, like on on like uh, our third date, she like looks down at her phone. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry, my cousin just died. You know, like, uh, like this is something which is completely unthinkable to my class background. Um, you know, because the assumption is that the social support is there, right? Whereas, um, whereas the assumption from my class background is that it's not. Yeah. Right. And, and so, yeah. I mean, I I have been the other end of your relationship. Um. So it's it's a. It's a thing to see. It's often, but the funny thing is, like, a lot of people would, and I, I talk about this, like, people from a working class background, when we get out of the working class, we tend to actually be, um, because of these values and the, uh, like, I believe in class virtues. I don't believe in, like, generic moral realism in the sense that I think that, like, you have a deontological moral rule that you could have or the utilitarianism could ever make sense or anything like that. But I do believe that there's a certain set of, of, of qualities that you have in classical sense, call them virtues that will help you exceed in certain contexts. And thus people from certain classes will likely have certain virtues and certain vices because they're incentivized or disincentivized in that context. And while you can't one-to-one -one predict it because you can't, that's a part of the whole fallacy like there, you know, you will always meet exceptions in the individual, but as trends, you sure as hell can predict it. Yeah. Um, and that's what we talk about, like working class virtue or petit bourgeois virtue or bourgeois virtue. Um, and I do think like, despite my deep hatred of the bourgeoisie, um, <laughs> uh, I actually do think there is such a thing as bourgeois, as bourgeois virtue that is good. Yeah. Right. Like, um, a lot of times now we call this whiteness and white values, which is stupid, but whatever. Especially because, as Lash says, it offers the opportunity to transcend those values and right. to well, hypocrisy and to use it as a weapon. Um, well, this is one of the things where, like, people, and I know this is conservative, conservative dishonest bullshit in a lot of ways, right? But I want I want to get into this when people talk about like 
some of the people who had the strongest responses to stuff like time preference is a white value. All right. We're formerly working class teachers, both white and of color, who took exception to that. Right. Because we're like, you are telling people that the one thing we can do in bourgeois society is whiteness and they shouldn't do it. And we should coddle these people. Whereas I know that once you leave these institutions, that won't happen. And so you are setting them up to lose. Yeah. I mean, my dad is definitely the person in my family who's the most uh, very anti-wokeness. Mm. And he grew up dirt poor. I mean, he right. lived in a car for a couple of years. Um, you know, he had he had a very unstable childhood in many ways. Um, and, you know, it's it's not so much that he's he's. He, you know, he's he's appreciative of the fact that he was able to through, real, you know, less explicitly personal things like education, things that were relatively impersonal, things that were had particular meritocratic roots, even if, you know, this is not like generalized. Even if meritocracy is bullshit. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Which Lash does realize, by the Which way. Which Lash does realize, um, you know, there, there's certain things that stuff like education gives you, which if you're pulling it away uh, without any replacement, it's going to be hugely detrimental. Mm -hmm. um, and the danger is, is always critique without replacement um, for a lot of things like this or, right. or destruction without replacement. Right. So, so for one thing that I would say, for example, for all my critiques of academic culture, um, and or I actually now think the university administrative apparatus is a bloat on all society that threatens it, like at a, at a fundamental level. Um, and I'm not talking about professors here either. Yeah. Um, but with all that said, um, I am worried about this period we're entering where that's dying back, uh, because I don't see it being replaced with anything. Yeah, I mean, maybe podcast or some shit like that. Like excellent. maybe what I do. Nothing to look forward to. Uh, like, yeah, because because for every me, there's a Jordan Peterson with like a bajillion more followers, who's <laughs> giving bad advice. And bad. I will also say that you're the only podcaster I've ever listened to that my dad likes, um, <laughs> which is hilarious because he's like, like he's. He's uh, I love my dad for the record, but he's he's um, you know, like very like into like personal greatness, and he's now a small business owner. Um, so he's not the kind of person you would expect to like Varn vlogs, but he's like this guy's smart and he knows what's going on, um, <laughs> which is just like amazing. Well, you know, you know what it is though. I mean, I. I have practiced talking to non-leftists most of my life because I don't live in areas that are predominantly filled with leftists. In fact, until I was, I, I've told the story a lot of times, but like I, I didn't really realize that, that anyone other than punk rockers were leftists until like 1998 when I was 18 years old and we went to the Battle of Seattle. Wait, hold up. You're telling me there's somebody other than punk rockers who are leftists. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and but then, but then I met them and I was like horrified. <laughs> Like, I was like, oh, my God, um, and, and because I wasn't – I don't know what I thought. I, I guess I thought – you know what I thought? I'd watched Mate One as a kid, and then I'd seen, like, all these boomer documentaries about how cool the, the hippies and the new left were. And, of course, they conflated the two as if they were the same thing. Um, and I was like, well, they're either going to be a bunch of hippies or they're going to be a bunch of union people. Are they going to be, like, the Black Panthers? I don't know. What else is there? And, and, and I say this, okay, because my exposure to this world is zines, is boomer documentaries that turn the new, as I, I've now said to Jason Miles and their reconceptual, uh, reconceptualization of, of like the new left and the hippie movement, turned, turned, turned the new left into a vibe. Um, or uh, it's like Rage Against the Machine and getting Angela Davis, Panthers, and like 
the shining path kind of half digested thrown at me through popular music, but with no context. Um, and so when I go out to the battle for Seattle and I meet a bunch of like college students who are mostly upper middle class and yeah, they're kind of in the same punk vein as me, but they're kind of really obnoxious and like do good or, upper middle class types my response is to like well pat buchanan's there and he sounds reasonable yeah like and that that set a seed that manifested later when i ran into a conservative professor and then these and then uh the anti-war movement in the south you know uh because international answer which was a weird marxist leninist formerly Trotskyist thing front group that had all kinds of strange politics and seemed very strange to me didn't seem cool when I actually met them and then I was like I don't know I'm gonna go hang out with like Scott Horton like and antiwar.com and all those guys because they they you know and then I would read all these hagiographies by people like Paul Gottfried on you know the old anti-war left and how we should hate the Republicans but also the Democrats are also the party of war and Blah, 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 blah. You know, and it, if I was a conspiracy minded person, I could have easily been pulled into early Alex Jones orbit. Not so that helped. But um, I say that to say that the left milieu is very hard for a lot of people to get to, because even after being a leftist for a few years and even a professor, I had this run-in in New York. It's actually when I joined the Platypus Affiliated Society that very weekend. This is the weekend that it happened. It wasn't the Platypus that actually did this either. I had this run-in with this guy who was of crime things. He was an anarchist who went to Sarah Lawrence, and we were at a bar in Brooklyn. And he's like, we're both talking to this to this young woman, one of which is a poet. I She's talking to me about art. I'm talking to her about art. She, I think everyone thinks I'm hitting on her. I'm not, actually weirdly um because she's young people are gross um and i'm already at this point i'm already 30 so i already come to the conclusion young people are gross um sorry young person uh so <laughs> this is my this is my bigotry i'm ageist against the young don't worry um, <laughs> yeah. well i i kind of think you don't deserve it but but whatever I, I do actually, this is funny because I do actually think, this is one thing I agree with, with Lash on the individual psychological level. People who are obsessed with youth are usually afraid of death. Um, and I'm not. So. Why, this is why Gen Z is like, uh, is so different than the millennials is because we're not obsessed with youth. We're obsessed with death. Yeah. Um, you know, like they're like, oh my God, the world's ending. We're like, all right. Okay. Ready. Yeah, Gen Z is like a generation that has my sense of humor, but actually believes it. Yeah, no, we're we're like a we're very silent Gen in terms of our mannerisms. Our our Gen Xer, or is, Gen Xer, yeah. Well, all of our parents are Gen Xers. Right, right. But so you're like the mirror inversion. You have none of the reaction, but all the nihilism. Yeah, it's even worse. No, I'm I'm joking. Yeah, right. no, I, I'm not sure that you're not wrong, but uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, back to a bar in Brooklyn. Uh, back to a bar in Brooklyn, and this this guy shames me for not speaking good Mandarin. All right, now I'm working class. I have learned Korean from going to Korea, and I started learning Chinese, which I gave up on because it's really hard to learn on your own. Like from lessons that were free at the university. I have not, no school, even the state school I went to offered these languages to study, even if I wanted to. I did not come from an elite educational background and had no access to, because even though I got into some of the schools I was accepted into Emory, for example, I could not afford to go. So that was my first encounter was this dude shaming me as if I because as a 30 year old who was learning the languages on the fly I could not speak perfect Mandarin as opposed to a person who had picked it up at Sarah Lawrence and had to have practice and had money and time that that I you know that I should feel bad and then he did all this cultural capital shit and I'm like you're a fucking crime think anarchist that's so weird right like 
why are you why are you doing this weird like i would expect this from like some even a liberal lawyer but like in like in a lot like in a, in a but we're not in a competitive we're drinking out a bar after occupy that's literally the context of this of course, so of course the next day i joined platypus philly society but uh that's not entirely why. No, yeah. <laughs> but 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 i say this story because that is a lot of people's experience if they're from the work if they're coming out of the working class when they meet people like that not just liberals but radicals yeah and this is the way they're treated usually and a lot of people don't even realize they're doing it i've heard many leftists some of whom even talk about you know some of whom are even sympathetic to the post left who will refer to like georgia as not civilization now i don't have a like i think romanticizing red state culture is horseshit but i'm always telling people those people are mad flyover country is mad for a reason you basically treated us as an internal colony for like a hundred years and then when we start taking more tax money not even for ourselves you know what it's going to it's going to the goddamn military bases which your global the, trade the, network is dependent on by the way and the prisons is the other yeah. thing and, like, and, uh, yeah. like yeah, draft in idaho uh, right, governor. He used the COVID funds to just build another prison. Right, and in prison exp expansion, and also last time I checked, if you're not in New York or LA or or, or the Bay, we're also the most ethnically diverse part of the United States as well. Yeah, in, especially compared to like general New England or once you get out of uh, New York City in New York. I've been upstate. I know what it's like. I've been to both Ithaca and Oswego. So like. I say this to point out that like there's a reason why these people are angry and a lot of times it's just I literally had someone during during the uh during covid so well the covid response just proves that people who aren't liberals and don't live in the urban areas are just totally morally reprobate this was a guy who claimed to be a fucking marxist all right and I I ended up like blocking all contact with this dude but I was like look for one I want you like even even the heterodox academy people, people I don't love, but they're right about this. You have to look at COVID transmission spreads about why there might be different attitudes between rural areas, suburban areas, and urban areas, and why it, it takes a lot more time for for there to be danger in rural areas. And also, the biggest comorbid factor for massive death rates isn't even masking or unmasking policies; is age. So. Why are you shaming these people as if they're totally morally reprobate except to flatter yourself, right? Like this to bring it back to Lash. There's a reason why I went on this whole rant. I, and I, I mean, I also think it's there's a big difference between asking people for moral sacrifices for four months and for, you know, a year and a half, right? Uh, oh, yeah. If I you're mean, not even though the ask was really small at the end, because I do think the mask ask is a small ask. I've lived in Asia. We, you know, everybody masks up yeah. culturally during the winter anyway. Um you know that's true, and, and no, it's not a it's it's not a hard ask, and a lot of the mass conspiracies are dumb. It's also not as effective as it was pitched. Yeah, I mean um, it's 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 symbolic of the bigger asks. Yeah, um, that's what's going on. Yeah, and, and and when people ask that, I'm like, yeah, basically, you want people. You, you some of you have said you want people to go on the lockdown forever, and what what this to me says is like you're not even asking society to fix this. We're not asking the FCC. To figure out what we need to do beyond a vaccination policy to do that. In fact, we're not, even though we claim to follow the science, and I'm going to sound like a conservative here, but it's true. Even though we claim to follow the science, we have ignored the politicization of the FCC under Biden, even though it's done things that that Trump wanted to do. The the CDC. Yeah. The CDC, not the FTC. Sorry. Get um, ranty and we're, I also said the HWO and I meant the NOW earlier. So, so uh, for those of you, that's an episode one of this. But, uh, but no, no, but I mean, you're right. And, you know, my uh, my grandma is like a big institutionalist. She was in the Securities mm -hmm. Exchange Commission. Um, under oh, the Trump. devil. Okay. Yeah. I'm, under, kidding. Uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, I don't she, like was, she was called the only commissioner with any balls uh, as uh -oh. the first woman commissioner. Uh, so, but she's, you know, the thing she's so concerned I'd be afraid about, of your grandma. I'm afraid <laughs> of my grandma. Um, but, but anyway, she, you know... She's she's a big institutionalist for a lot of 
understandable reasons considering her career and when she grew up and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And she's terrified of the politicization of various agencies. And I think that uh, the politicization of various agencies under the terms it's being politicized is a terrifying thing because it's not being politicized in order to act as an avenue for radical change. They're being politicized to act as an avenue for the interests of various sectional groups, right. uh, sectors of the bourgeoisie. Yeah. You know, and if the CDC is favorable to the Democratic Party, well, you know, who gets all the pharma money, right? Exactly. Uh, if the, um, you know, the, there's various other agencies which are politicized by conservatives, like the Department of Energy, right? Typically, um, you know, it, it's reflective of of the, the various interest group, interest groups within each of these parties. And it's an attempt to divvy up the spoils of what's ostensibly an organ of democratic governance, uh, which is obviously debatable, but, you know, in, in practice, but it's a very, it's a very frightening thing. And it's something which people should be worried about and should not either pretend is not happening or pretend is only happening uh, by you know, by the right, by Trumpist right, or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the bigger concessions to capital were actually made under Biden with the five day rule and then the progressive. And and, and I want people to I, I'm going to say a little fact that should really disturb people. And this is why anti vax conspiracy, because these things have a consequence as far as science goes. Like, I'm not an anti vaxxer but high like pretending that the efficacy was as high as like Rachel Maddow was doing. Um. It, it leads people to distrust things. Bingo. It, it, it actually it, it promotes. People would have taken the vaccine if it had been, you know, said to have like a 60 percent rating, you know, like people took J&J. &J, right. Right. Uh, but and, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not discounting the efficacy of Moderna or Pfizer or whatever. Um, I'm pointing out that pretending that pretending that you have a vaccination and then we've solved this social issue is at odds with both the science, you know, and ultimately the politics of trying to solve the social issue. Right. Exactly. And, and, and then censoring critiques of it made it look like the critiques were more valid than they were. Yeah. When like, in reality, you know, a lot of the anti-vax most, almost all of the anti-vax stuff, is complete and utter bullshit. There are some things, like for example, uh, the increasing of myocarditis amongst younger uh, takers of the vaccine. That's real. Um, yeah. But, but it's, it's robbed of it's robbed contextually of right. what that means. I mean, like the COVID vaccine has a lower complication rate than aspirin. Um, Agreed. Like but, I'm just I'm just I'm ag I'm in agreement with you. I'm just pointing out that the terms under which these. Uh, these disputes were arbitrated within society led people to think that something much more nefarious was going on than actually was and accept the dumb critiques instead of focusing on the real things. Right. And I mean, for me, the biggest real thing was this is a respiratory virus. Um, and we historically know with respiratory viruses that you have to have high revaccination rates and the efficacy is strong for a brief period of time. But unless you were to, I don't know, distribute this virus worldwide and give everyone on the planet the, the vaccine overnight, we know that respiratory viruses mutate quickly. They yeah. tend, although not always, to become slightly less lethal. Um, or at least less lethal to those with initial vaccinations. But, and we don't always understand how COVID, like how COVID entirely works, but like we oversold this and we shouldn't have. And I don't like, there There has been a cynicism and, and this is what COVID exposed in our institutions. Uh, and monkeypox has exposed this too, like treating monkeypox as it's an STI has let is now leading to accusations that gay men are like raping animals and children and giving them monkeypox. Right. It, it's, it's even where it's, it's doing, it's making the same mistake that Fauci and the CDC made in the eighties in regards to AIDS and expanding it to something that isn't even an STI. Right. 
now, yes, the the highest variable transmission is intimate contact, and yes, it's it's intimate contact between men first. But any skin to skin contact, any household contact, can spread it. And there's actually evidence that the CDC has removed from part of its website and not the other that that says that it's immediate proximity airborne. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not like kind of. I'm not super up to date on. Uh, on monkeypox or anything relating to it. So I'm going to take your word for all of this, but I'm going to agree with you that it is an example of the way in which questions which, you know, I'm, it's, not sure, it's not clear how possible it ever is to, to discuss these things as a matter of technique, but institutions which are ostensibly designed to address it as a matter of technique, it's very clear that they don't do that anymore. Right. And this is this is my point. And my point is not that conspiracists are right. My point is that these institutions serve certain factions within the government who serve certain factions in society. Yeah. And no, they're not out to kill people. Yes, the average CDC worker in my true and humble beliefs really wants to help people. I absolutely believe that. I used to live in Georgia. I've met some of them. Like, that's not my point. My point is, however, their po- their directives come with funding and political agendas. It's, and that's it's, a, mm-hmm. it's what we were talking about before. How do you solve a social issue? Do which under whose terms do you solve the right. social? Who issue? pays the price of solving social issue? Yeah, right. Which which connects to a lot of Lash's most misused examinations, which is stuff like the anti-busing movement, where. In admitting, even though he admitted how recess the anti-busing movement was and was really opposed to that, which is one reason you should not take it as an endorsement of the anti-busing movement or other similarly uh, racist movements, he pointed out that under the terms of desegregation, lower class white people bore a greater brunt than upper class white people did. Um, And... This is That's still true, by the way. Yeah, um, you and know, New York was exempted from it. I, I was like the point, like like most of the Northeast was was true. Like this is another thing that like really gets my goat because I'm always like, well, what is it like to go to school in the South? Aren't the school things are segregated? And yeah, there was stuff like we had a segregated prom court when I was in high school. I talked about it. We had places that wouldn't have prom, so they wouldn't have interracial dancing. Also true, but you know what? We have mixed race schools. We have mixed class schools. Uh, New York is the most segregated school system in the United States and possibly on earth. Yeah. Um, And, you know, particular legalistic forms were used to make that happen. Right. Uh, This is another thing that, that Lash is actually very good on when he talks about how how progressives. This is actually the 87 essay on something I agree with him about. Uh, gave up as soon as the civil rights amendment became hard, they gave up on that, started picking up the tactics of the Warren court and pushed everything through the courts without thinking about what that did. Yeah. All right. What it effectively did was make the Supreme court an arbitrator of the problems of the constitution in a way that made it a unelected dictatorial ship and could be taken over by the right really easily. And has been. Now, and now that it's happened, and it has been historically for almost all of American history, right? The war was a weird blip. Word. You know, like uh, people people ask me if they, if I think because I studied labor law and labor history that something like the Lochner Court is going to happen again, and I say no. And the reason for that is because a lot of the arbitration of these decisions was removed from the courts and put into the Wagner Act in a more permanent form. Um, right. This isn't now, true. If they figured out a way to, uh, to declare the Ragnar Act unconstitutional, then we're fucked. But. Yeah, I, I think that's unlikely at the current juncture. But Me too. But it is it's not totally is, impossible. <laughs> well, what is likely is things like the Janus decision, where things that are already in the realm of court decision can be undone. The court, you know, and the Constitution can be stretched in particular ways that are favorable to particular interests. Um, You know, like you don't have to delve into the unrealistically apocalyptic to recognize things are really bad. (laughs) 
And so, so why, why go that far? You know, you've got right. plenty of examples. Oh yeah. I agree with you. Um, I, I agree with you. I would just say that like, there are days actually where I kind of want them to reverse the wag. <laughs> Cause I'm just like make class war open again. I'm joking, but not entirely. Um, He's joking, just, or is he? <laughs> um, I mean, I uh, Sean Camby and I have gone back and forth on whether or not we think like maybe getting rid of the Ragnarok would just make it so obvious what's going on that it would be hard to deny anymore. But then I'm like, but that's accelerationist logic, and that almost always backfires. And I know yeah. that. I mean, um, you know, like the. I, I think a better example of what should be done is, is something like, you know, Lash talks in the 70s about how structural reform is important and it's in temporary ways like that that the left should ally with liberals. Um, so I think, you know, like rather than a generalized endorsement of the principles of the Democratic Party, a selective advocacy for something like the PRO Act is not like a bad thing to do. You know, it's got limitations, it's got problems, but cohesive structural reforms are really important in order to generate new arenas of conflict that can be won out. Right. Uh, I agree with you wholeheartedly, which is why I'm, people think I'm a total abstentionist and I'm always like, no, I'm a united frontist. What that means is you only ever provisionally give support on certain issues and you punish regardless of party if it's not delivered on yeah uh it is not like i'm afraid of the other guys so i'm always going to support you no matter what it's i'm afraid of both you but you might do what i need you to do right now so like i will vote for you this one time for you to do this one thing and if you don't vote it i'm going to start something to primary your ass yeah. or to mess with your campaign or whatever now like like, uh, and honestly, you know, the DSA or types have gone back and forth on this, um, uh, you know, but my, my, my point on that is like, yeah, I'm not against reforms. I'm not against voter reforms, but it's just important that it's done in a conscious way and for the proper, through the proper limited, reasoning, basically. Limited and provisional aims and limited and provisional and critical support only on certain things and never to the party as a whole. Like, now I admit that's harder to do in the United States because we're not Europe. And in Europe, the parliamentary system makes this, made this, it, although game theoretically is still ran into a problem if you read the works of Adam per, uh, Sparowski. Yeah. Um, but it, it is the logic of the first and second internationals limited endorsement of electoralism. Like that's why it exists. It's also, this is something where I think Lash is decent, but doesn't, quite understand the terms because again he's mostly focused on america um where he talks about like the problems that the iww ran into that the spa got around um and he talks about like the, you know the, the kind of concessions to the socialist right that had to be made um but what he misses is like Debs is genius is somehow he's able to do that and actually maintain a maximalist position that's even syndicalist in its orientation. Like that's not something that's, that's a, you know, William C he, he kind of gets it in true and only heaven when he talks about William C Foster and William C Foster's movement from anarcho anarcho syndicalism into Marxist Leninism and then back into anarcho syndicalism. Like, um, and a little bit also with like the the Fabians and stuff right. like this. Yeah, um, he sees the problem. He sees some of the issues with the fa with Fabianism pretty accurately. Um, but I, I think this is this is just because Lash is a pr this is where having such an American centric view is kind of a limitation because somebody you would have, thinks this is not part of our tradition. Yeah, and you know you would have preferred he spend some some time with, I imagine the kibbutz movement, the cordones, you know, yeah. alternative structures that uh, can present as examples of the alternate institutions he calls for. Right. And, and also it, it would have got him out of his 
it would have backed him up a little bit on the problems of of a biological views of the family if you studied Kabutsum. Uh But what it would also do is point out the viability of certain alternative forms of family, which Lash actually um, it's, he he just kind of precludes. brackets out. Yeah, he just yeah. precludes. Um, like, yeah, I mean, because I mean, he basically he basically actually does say that companionate non-productive marriages are not families <laughs> like yeah like, he, like i mean i i've always found that he seems to suggest that some type of extended family is the best form uh which i you know i'm obviously prejudiced in favor of because i'm part of a large jewish family right uh, i'm also part of a large family but it has its problems um i i however more or less I, I see. I think where Lash gets in trouble, where where like Lily and Ruby in that in that debate really gets the better of him, is when she points out that he equivocates between the petty bourgeois and bourgeois families, yeah. like the traditional working class family, and even in his response to her, I, I go line by line and show that like, oh, he he actually removes the word bourgeois family in responding to her, and I'm like, uh huh, yeah. um, you like like. I do think, naturally speaking, extended family, and I would actually include chosen family into this. And the reason why I talk about chosen family so much is because it gets to the aims of 19th century family abolition, what it was actually aimed at doing, um, which was not to make everyone a ward of the state. Yeah, I mean, the social republic. That wasn't what Marx and Engels were talking about that for. Like, you know, like you can see in, in the, the 10 point plan or whatever it is in the communist manifesto i think it's there yeah uh, where it's like you know universal education uh you know an end to like it's calling for an end to the exploitation of children economically right although it also does say that like i was almost gotten a fight with reed kane because he's like it says you know child labor is okay in certain circumstances I'm like yeah it does it says that like 16 to 18 year olds should be able to labor but but by choice, yeah, and then like uh, 10 to 14 year olds should be able to engage in labor at the home, and by that, I mean chores, like, yeah, like, so I mean, that's it's, not what we meant by child labor in the 18th century, yeah. It's not like, <laughs> like you know, and this is this is, I think, one way in which Lash on the family is very strong, it's just in pointing out how idiotic some of the maximalist critiques of the family are and you see this especially in the online left where it's like every like 10 you know every like 10 days somebody's gonna go viral for being like why communism would abolish chores why bedtime is a symbol of class power like and it's like no you know there you have to focus on the real errors in the current structure of the family not like i don't want to do my chores like that's stupid um yeah that's no that's uh, that's also for the people who think you're going to be able to automate away any and all work. Yeah. And plus Chores, dishwashing. Let me tell you, under socialism, dishwashing will be all day, every day, all the. No, I'm joking, um, but I digress. No, I think this is, but it's this is part of the. Uh, this is part of the problem that we have by the way that we've inherited certain. Uh, kinds of talks about women, about feminism, about all these things. Because, like, one of the things people would be surprised about from a person who, who loves Christopher Lash, there are occasionally times where I actually side with the feminist critique of him. I don't like the more blatant and vulgar ones. But, like, I do think some of the points they say about his limiting the family to a productive unit and a monogamous productive unit is just not historically true. Yeah. Right. It's just like, like, like that period, of, like Lily and Ruby pointing out that that form of the family is really limited to like 150 years of American history and, and, and capitalism is more or less correct. And that it only gets universalized to everybody um, in the 1950s. And the reason why it does is an expansion of markets, which is something yeah. Lash is actually acutely aware of in other ways like this is where like lash is aware of some feminist criticisms that's legitimate but he doesn't quite put it together 
Well, you kind um, of see this. The best example of this is in his examination of, of uh, Betty Friedan in the mm. uh, Women in the Common Life essay on the suburbs, mm. um, which is from earlier. Uh, but he like basically admits exactly what you're saying now. Uh, and then the only reason you don't need to servants and whatnot, and basically women who are not allowed to marry are only allowed to marry within certain context and have to stay as part of the household and are basically, even though they're employees treated as the dependents of the powder familias or whatever yeah. is, is because we have, you know, are, are, are in the case, in the case of in America, it's racialized as well. Um, it's because we replaced them with, as that form of power goes away in the beginning of the 20th century, we replace that with machinery. Yeah. Literally. Like, and it's not a very, it is a very isolating and unfulfilling thing. And at first it is only the upper middle class women, the Betty for the ends of the world who get it. Um, but it is by, by the sixties, it's semi universalized. Uh, the switch from commander in chief of the household to consumer in chief of the household. Yep. Exactly. And that, you know, but that also leads me to think, you know, that some of like what Lash talks about as the main figures of, of the end of Fordism is, is what the, what you call, you know, the pimp and the happy prostitute or the happy hooker uh, in culture of narcissism. I actually think that's kind of an insightful thing because we do use instrument and this has gotten worse. We yeah. Do I mean, use instrumentized relations all the time now as our primary forms of interaction. Yeah. I, and I, you know, this is, I, I think in terms of this getting worse, like you see so many, so many people who, who, who justify exploitive relationships with themselves mm -hmm. as emancipatory. Um, you know, so a, a very good example of this is, I don't know if you've heard of Ayaya. Uh, she's like a former, what? Yeah, but go ahead, Fred. I don't know that my audience has because my audience yeah, is. She's a, a former OnlyFans model and escort who uh, now does like data science online. Mm -hmm. um, she's uh, she makes the rounds on Twitter every once in a while because uh, you know she's she's very uh, she's big on Twitter, um, and she she writes about how empowering. Uh, this aspect of her life was. And, you know, I'm not going to like say, oh, it wasn't empowering or whatever. Um, because, you know, obviously I, I don't live in her head. Um, but the terms of, of that, the terms of what you assume empowerment to be by marketizing yourself uh, effectively is it a form which I find detrimental? And I think Lash anticipates in his examination of stuff like the happy hooker, the way in which this relationship with yourself occurs in a broader sense for all of society um, and is encouraged uh, a way of, of, ma of marketing yourself, of um, commodifying particular aspects of your personality, um, you know, mm -hmm. which is, is, is very, sad and as i say as a person who literally commodifies my ranty intellectual nature for rents um voluntary rents mind you but still um i mean this is something i'm acutely aware of too one is because i have found uh, I've, I've, i'm always hesitant to go here but i'm going to go here anyway i have found the discussion of sex negativity and sex positivity are of quote sex work on the left to be laughably unnuanced. So, for example, treating street walking as the same as being an escort, as the same as being an OnlyFans model, as the same as taking a few nudes for money once in your life. Like we talk about these as all uh, as as all sex workers, but the the experience of that is radically different, and the um, and the, highly class too, by the way. But still, yeah, I mean, like it's you know to be a you have a uh, particular avenues of power as a high paid DC escort, let's say mm -hmm. that you will not have if you're walking the streets of some impoverished town somewhere else in the country. Right. And I think with, with only fans, there's a power law there with someone like by may be, may legitimately feel 
liberated. But I have also very much seen many, quote, e-girls, unquote, women in their mid-20s who start off, like, making some kind of niche material, uh, but they're cute, on TikTok or are on... Uh, Or on Instagram, wherever you're doing, you know, and yes, their sexual appeal is part of their appeal. And then they are seemingly like a moth to a flame end up on OnlyFans for a little while. They often don't stay there. You know, it's not, but it's, it's a very weird development that I see happen over and over again. Do I think all these women aren't happy or are super exploited? No. But I, I do think we have to deal with the fact that there's there's some path dependency here that's that is based on some fundamental exploitation and some fundamental commodification of relationships that's hard to not think has some psychological cost. I, I don't think I am. I've been one of the few people and I, this is another thing I've been accused of being a conservative on, but I, I've seen it in real life. Um, teenagers don't date. Yeah, they yeah, are we, inundated with sex, and they don't date. Yeah, people my age are pretty sex sex negative themselves. They're like, like sexless. I don't even say it's like it's, yeah, it's no. I mean, people. A lot of people my age don't drink, don't smoke, don't you know, don't smoke pot, don't date. You know, uh, this is pretty common. And, and it's, it's like the description of except it's for both genders. Yeah, it's like the description that Fukuyama gave of like the the man boy culture in Japan in the '90s, but it's yeah. like an entire generation. Well, but what have, are the you have incels and fem cells now, right? Um, um, and that was something I saw. That's something I saw early in 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 Korea. Although for cultural reasons that are different, this is why I do think culture matters. Like a lot of women were not dating until their late. 30s and they were and they were not dating korean men um not because of racial animus or anything like that or uh, even a particularly high form of abuse but because the labor the traditional labor expected of of daughters-in-law in a confucian household is stultifying and they were trying to avoid it and since they also had a career on top of it and they made and this is where i will point out like in japan and in korea the sexism on on earnings per dollar for women is really 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 bad like yeah. it's like something like 40 cents on the dollar um and so this actually destroyed um in many ways uh, you know dating culture led to an increase of a, a increase of of sex work um uh, across the board um I believe there was a stat that said, uh, you know, like half of Korean men lose their virginity to prostitutes. Um, and and this is a natural result of this process that I'm now seeing happening here. So you and ex except here that I think, you know, because of the ubiquity of porn and I'm not anti porn, by the way, I want like like I'm not pro or anti it's, to me. It's a thing like it's a social force. It's like watching people eat. I, I'm also not anti the food channel. It's like being anti-war. I'm going to lose that battle. Um, uh, at least in anti-war stuff, I, I kind of know specifically in, in, in that specific instance what I'm fighting. But at the same token, I think we do have to deal with the fact that um, and Lash's stuff on, sex, on, on sexuality is actually not wrong on this element. That the hyper commodification of sex and its ubiquity in society has made it, frankly, unfucking attractive. Yeah, I mean, it's made it unattractive, and it's also made it uh, difficult to interact with. Right. You know, it's, it, you know, especially you. You hear this a lot, where um, young men will, like, the first time really having sex, they'll carry out uh, particular behaviors that appear in porn yeah which is a um, very bad idea but yeah. which, which is a very bad idea um and uh but you know it also is really like clear that for most people you're not going to be as 
attractive in whatever way as the people on screen, you're not going to be as, you know, efficacious, like able to move yourself in that way. So I, I'm just illustrating that it, it professionalizes and then resells even the act of lovemaking in a way. Yeah. And um, in a way that is also completely unrealistic. And if you actually did it highly unsatisfying. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, like it's, and, and it's, it's stuff like this where just accepting, accepting the terms of like empowerment or uh, freeing yourself or whatever. Our victimization is, even, I, I, either one of these things to me doesn't get to the core yeah, of the problem. It, it eschews responsibility for having your movement address a cultural phenomenon. And if you have an, a good movement, you have to be aware of like – Everything important going on in society. Right. You have um, to speak to the fact that OnlyFans is a thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and yeah, like I'm I'm for example, I'm not against the sex workers union. I'm actually really not. I think it's a great idea, but that's not gonna fix the that's not going to fix this. Um I'm also one of those people who thinks like, well, Jordan Peterson's answer to the incel problem is fucked up. Um but at least he's talking about the incel problem. And the, we, we talk about the incel problem on the left often as it's purely a product of misogyny. And I'm like, or, that's not true. Or to make fun of a lot of people who have real problems and are really not lonely. Right. You know? um, which I think is, is sad, even if in many ways the way they, you know, they organize that loneliness is really reprehensible. And, when, and, and this is even true for, like, feminist women who really want to sincerely address this without being mocking. And there are, right? They end up being mocked, too. Yeah. Like, and so it's like, what are we driving for here? Are we trying to fix the social problem? Or are we trying to reaffirm our own fucking identity? And if, if, if your response to incels as a social phenomenon is mockery, you are doing the latter. There's no, there's no other explanation because it's not smart, you know, even if you think that like what they want is can't happen, you know, or, you know, maybe we need to talk about like how you could have more time and develop yourself more. Uh, and if you have more economic security, you could do that and you would, you could make yourself a more attractive uh, person as opposed to, because I, you know, I can tell you it's really not the bar for men is actually kind of low. I'm not going to lie about that, but to be, to be an attractive partner um, is, would require some self cultivation and that requires at least social, maybe not, maybe not money, although often it does, but, but at least social resources to do. And we, we have to admit that, Right. This is not, you know, pity the poor misogynist. Like, you know, it is address the fact that they exist and are people. You right. Know? And, and why it would have been attractive to people who otherwise would not go there. Yes, there's a certain amount of population who's always going to be a dick bag. Yeah. But and but you know, that I think population that, that part part that part of the population is low. I think this is also speak. You know, this movements like this speak to a lot of the people who the left claims to be speaking to right now. So. You know, the, the incel movement is by and large, based on what I know about it, not it's not a, like a white movement. It's got a, a heavy number of young Asian men, of young Latino men, you know, young black men. And that even it shows is, up in the shootings around it, honestly. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is a multiracial movement of young, lonely, depressed men. Uh, and so, you know, it's not it's not something which can be lambasted as a replacement for, you know, how Obama talked about rural white people cling to their like guns and religion or whatever. It's a social phenomenon which addresses the perceived uh, difficulties of a large group of people that cuts ac across class and racial groups in society. Um, I mean, also, I thought Obama saying that was also dumb, but yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm just pointing out that like it's not. It's not just like, oh, you know, these resentful people, right? 
Right. I mean, they are resentful. They're full resent to mom, but we don't give them anything not to be resent to mom about. Yeah. And a lot of the left is also full of resent to mom. Yeah. It, it, and so, I mean, the, the vices here, you know, and you want to talk about something. Resent to Ma is one of the few vices, you know, that, that Nietzsche talks about that I agree with Nietzsche on. It's destructive. And that Lash picks up. Right. Yeah. Lash is not a Nietzsche. And that's another difference between him and the postmodernist. He's not a Nietzsche in at all. Um, like not even a little bit, but that the encouragement of resentment does not embedder people. It does not lead them to action that is positive. It leads them to random violence and our, 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 our demobilization, our suicide, like, and, um, I think in some ways random violence is, is the outward expression of that. Right. But like, you know, but by far the most likely outcome is someone is going to be super depressed, and if if, if it gets real bad, they will kill themselves, and um, that shows up in the stats. And you know, this is where I'm just like, I'm bringing stats to the game now when I talk about this stuff because I'm now like, we have to deal with social reality. We cannot just deal with our constructs of things, um, and. We cannot because our constructs often flatter us, and we should distrust anything right now. It flatter us. One of the reasons this is an impulse I get from Lash that I think is smart. Uh, unhappy making notions that come out of the left should also problematize ourselves a lot of the time, because we are part of the society. We have a function in society, whether we like it or not, and we have to realize what that function is. Um, if we want to be a radical force, we also have to know why. Why does well, you know? Why isn't Cohen Pro crushing our ass? Like, why is it Cohen Pro just messing with us every day? Like, why aren't why aren't those CIA conspiracies true? Like, they used to be. Why aren't they now? Right? What has happened? Why is no one Congress of cultural freedom freedoming us because we apparently can do it good enough to ourselves? Yeah. Um. And so the question goes like, how do you deal with that? What's the function? Now, this let's, let's pivot to the, the thing I really wanted to talk to you about, because this is a part of, of the mineral stuff that I both love and find myself sometimes being super skeptical on, because this is the most directly Freudian thing uh, outside of social narcissism. The party of the id, the ego, and the superego. Yeah, so what are they, who are they, and how do they work? So the party of the id is uh, not the term he uses. He uses the party of Narcissus. Yeah, he's a party of the the party of narcissists, the party of narcissism. But it's um, the id. This is roughly equivalent to the new left, uh, yeah. and it critiques and maybe libertarians and maybe libertarians, and it critiques uh, the boundary between the self and the outside world, which is in some way an attempt to address alienation, mm -hmm. um, and. He says it's addressing the most interesting questions, but for that reason, the fact that it has come up with unsatisfactory answers that assume things about, you know, psychology that are not possible, total union, are very dangerous. Uh, the party of the ego, he distinguishes two groups, the rational ego, which he calls equivalent to liberals, basically, and assumes that reason can fix uh, issues in society he seems to suggest he's part of something else the party that, so, so the party of ego would be what i used to call wonktopia wonktopia perfect uh where the ego ideal is what he roots himself as part of the guilty conscience which attempts to transcend the limitations of life while understanding their existence uh yeah, so this is the party of of original sin, kind of, but the party, the party of guilt, yeah, yeah, but it's original sin, but with the possibility of something beyond it, right? The like the redemption, redemption. The, right. the drive towards redemption. Right. Uh, in a this small is Lashley's way. most Christian, to be honest, but yeah, this is Lashley's most Christian, and it's also something I really like because it's common to how Judaism views the whole world. Um, which is something that can never be redeemed, that is unredeemed, but that we must redeem. Right. Uh, which, Seek them alone as opposed to as opposed to the fallen world. Yeah. Which I think is a big difference. I think, you know, as a person who's neither a Jew or a Christian, really, I mean, I am ethnically Jewish. And I'm, I'm 
I mean, I should say that like a copy of the Mishnah over there, but um, uh, it. So I'm not theologically illiterate. It's actually kind of funny because I'm halakhically just a Hebrew. I'm not really like a halakhic Jew. Um, uh, the explains a lot. Just joking. Yeah, it actually might. Um, but but by that it means I actually try harder uh, to like like so being a leftist. I hate to say it, part of the stereotype is true. There are a lot of Jews, and uh, I'm usually the only one who can explain law to people. <laughs> Everyone else is like, I don't know. We just do yeah, that. I mean, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, you go to like uh, you go to a pro-Palestine protest, and the entire audience uh, or the entire group is either like Palestinians or anti-Zionist Jews. Yes, uh, in New York. But anyway, so there's the party of the the ego ideal, um, mm-hmm. which is the one Lash likes. And isn't really represented in American life, he thinks. Right. Uh, and then there's the party of the superego, which he equates to neoconservatism and relies upon um, ascribed tradition as a means of regulating itself. Right. So this is the we, we the the Straussians, the Straussian secret liberals, but c- cynical. I mean, Leo Strauss actually literally advocated this. We, we are secretly secular liberals and. <laughs> And we're going to read entire the entirety of history going back to Plato as a cabal of secret sec, uh, of secret of, of secret secular liberals. But we're going to prescribe religion as a way to maintain and keep civic virtue around yeah. and to fill in for the functions or, of or the tradition, state. tradition, yeah, uh, kind. the right, implication uh, of a super ego in people as a replacement for a super state, right? Um, um, and and Lash's position. As the and, idea, as the ideal ego is somewhere in between that, but it is so, separate from it. I mean, a lot of this can be fit into the question of super state or super ego, right? For the party of the id, it's neither, um, neither super state nor super ego. For the party of the super ego, it's obviously super ego. For the party of the rational ego, it's super state, um, manifest through people's effective ego. And for the party of, of one, the party of Lash, uh, the party of the ego ideal, it's also neither but in a different way that assumes that the it itself and just union and, you know, like, you know. The, that antagonism is always with us that we can never fully join with the outside world. And like, Precisely, yeah. Right, exactly. yeah, yeah. Like it's. And what's interesting is he's always struggling later on after this realization of the minimal self to find a correlate to this ideal ego party, which it seems to be why he goes back and forth between populist and communitarians. Um, it's also for me, it's about to be dinner time. So I've Understood. got very, few, very little time. We can finish up this for like three minutes. Let's go. All right. Um, so, yeah. So basically what he does is in the true and only heaven, he sees populistic movements, which he defines as a mixture of a respect for limitation and a respect for uh, a distinct, you know, including a distinct self um, and a spiritual discipline against resentment, a search for the ideal, the ideal community and the ideal self as the best equivalency to the party of the ego ideal. Um, and he defines the splits that he talks about in the fractured ruling class in uh, the revolt of the elites as equivalent to uh, the party of the rational ego, the party of the super ego, and eventually the party of the it. And these are why he sees all three options as uncompelling, because they have very serious problems. Um, and so... And unfortunately, Revolta. now it seems like, I guess, to talk about, y'all let you finish on Revolt to Release, but it seems like to me the reason why I have trouble with this now is I'm like, I can't pick a party to which these people actually correspond to anymore. I see all three in both sides of the political spectrum now. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's very, very mixed up. And, you know, neoconservatives have declined. The new left is dead and has been for a very long time. And Wonktopia is getting its uh, ass kicked. It's <laughs> getting its ass kicked and uh, is on its way out. 
And right. so I think, you know, what you have is various forms of the id predominate in right. Trumpism. Uh, there's a mixture of the party of the id in terms that the new left would understand and the superego for everybody else, uh, except the people who believe in the rational ego for the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. um, and then the left itself is very much still the party of the id in general, in my opinion. Yeah, um, we're like the we're the great wall kickers down, but we have we want something that from Lash's perspective is impossible. It's impossible. Um, you know, and and from this, I think the fully one, automated gay luxury communism being. Yeah, exactly. Example of that. Um, which is like the secret dream of most leftists, in yes. my opinion. Um, yeah. And to me is not something I would want. You I'd know, be like, bored. I'd be, right. I'd be very bored. Um, I, you know, I also have. I don't want that radical of a rupture from history because I like being part of history, whatever, you know, like there's many reasons why I see myself as agreeing with a lot of lashes prescriptions in the ego ideal, except on a societal level rather than an individual level, because Jews do not have original sin right. uh, in the same way. And I, I'm using this as like, this is my theologic understanding because it's easy to understand this for me is comparable to just like generalized ethics, which Judaism speaks to, but are reasoned and are secular and should be understood as reasoned and or non sectarian uh, because no religion has a monopoly on the truth. Um, and because, you know, like you've, if you've read Halakha, you know, like a lot of this is nonsense. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of the rules, a lot of the rules are, this is what uh, Lashes talk about arbitrary rules. Actually, a lot of them are stupid, but fair. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, like, uh, and, and they're, and they're binding in their arbitrariness in a way that I do think sometimes we like, yeah, there's a reason why cultures have weird food taboos. They don't actually make sense. Like we could try to rationalize them, but like, like the, the D not just to use Jewish example, but like the DNA refusing to eat seafood because in their ancestral, history the fish people help them and, and it's like yeah yeah even the average indigenous person who is fairly traditional does not really believe that yeah but it holds their it's 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 a it's, it, you know it's part of part together. of the, the super ego aspect of even the ego ideal which is one reason why lash gets mistakenly lumped in with the super ego people it's because uh, um artificial rules for lash are important not because they constrain what you do but because they present a goal to strive for. Right. Um, and with that, you go out of a couple of minutes. What's the last thing you want to say before we end off today? Uh, I would encourage listeners to, uh, you know, give Varn money because he deserves it. Let's be honest. Um, and I would also encourage listeners to read The Minimal Self because it's what we've been going over in some form or another. For most of this conversation, yes, I was going to say, yeah, particularly this last half, even when we're talking about class issues or religion or whatever, we've been kind of talking about the minimal self. Um, thank you so much for coming on. You're going to come back. I can already probably like. There's not that many Lashians in the world, and I've, I'm gathering them up. Uh, at least the ones that aren't saying using him to say horrendous shit, um, and playing Ventriloquist with him. And that's one thing that I, I appreciate when I listen to your work, and I want to give you this credit. You're a close reader, and and you run to defend him, but I, you aren't putting words in his mouth or making him copacetic entirely to contemporary leftism, and I think that's important because I, I don't think, look, I don't think we can adopt a Lashian program. We can only understand a Lashian temperament. We can um, adopt a Lashian critique, and we can adopt a Lashian temperament, but right, there's no but Lashian program. There's no Lashian program. We got to build the program ourselves out of other stuff. And so that's the important thing to realize. And I think the people who, who want a Lashian program really are like this, the weirdo Steve Bannons of the world, and they have to ignore a large part of what he said to do it. So on that note, thank you, Elijah. Thank you so much for giving me so much of your time. I hope my listeners really enjoy this three hours and 45 minutes we've recorded. And you go enjoy your dinner. Have a great evening. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>